Welcome to 5G in the Factory and on the Road, presented by 5G Americas. I'd like to introduce you to the president of 5G Americas and your moderator for today's panel discussion, Chris Pearson. Chris, you have the floor. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. Uh, my name is Chris Pearson, as the uh, moderator had mentioned. I'm president of 5G Americas, and we are consider ourselves the uh, voice of 5G and LTE for the Americas region. Uh, many of you know us, you go to our website for more information on us, but uh, we work in you know, really the technical uh, arena, the uh, regulatory uh, processes arena, as well as uh, industry education for the overall wireless ecosystem. And uh, I'm really uh, pleased to be here today to be the moderator uh, for this really great event. Um, it's a webinar that we have organized on 5G in the factory and on the road. And if you look at it, um, this is baseball season in the United States. I mean, we're all hopeful for our, 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 our baseball major league teams uh, in each city. And really, if you look at what, where we are with 5G, we're probably in about the second inning, maybe the third inning uh, of, of a nine inning ball game. And we're starting to address uh, new use cases, uh, new applications, and really new innovation opportunity as we look at 5G and where it's going. So uh, I'm really uh, honored to be here to lead this discussion. Today we're gonna focus on 5G networks in the manufacturing and automotive sectors. Um, we have panelists uh, from leading companies that are gonna really provide some of their insight to us as far as what they see out there in the market, um, what's going on in the market, also what technology uh, is addressing some of these concerns and, and how that future looks for the progress of 5G in addressing these new opportunities. Um, without further ado, I don't want to take up any more time because we have six panelists and I think they're just going to be outstanding. And what we're going to do is allow them uh, just a, a short uh, two minutes to three minute introduction um, and they'll uh, provide an introduction of themselves or even maybe a little bit about their company. And we'll try to get through that real quick and then we'll start talking as a panel about some of these great opportunities and challenges as well. So let's start it off with uh, Brian Grease of AT&T. Uh, and uh, glad to be part of this panel this afternoon. Um, as you may know, AT&T has been in the IoT space for a long while now. Actually, our IoT organization was started back in 2008, and we've really grown a lot since then. You can actually click through to the next slide. Um, since then, I, we've... Well, back then, we were actually just connecting simple devices, everything from dog collars to digital photo frames to, uh, as, as many know, the the e-readers e were a very popular item back then. And uh, people were actually very, very quite surprised as to how and why their book would just show up on their e-readers after they downloaded it. So uh, that was where we really started to cut our teeth back in 2008, and we've grown quite a bit since then. Right now, we have over 2,900 different devices on AT&T's network. And through this slide, you can see just the just the wide range of different IoT devices that we support um, in this space. So you, as you as you kind of think about this, think about it as anything that connects on our, on our network outside of your typical handset. That's uh, some of the things that me and my colleagues work on to address and support within the industry. You can click on the next slide. Uh, and we've grown. We've grown a quite a bit since 2008. Uh, we have over 80 million total connected devices on our network. So what does that mean? About every one and a half seconds, we're connecting another device to AT&T's network. We have over 1 million devices um, in nine different industries, including automotive, consumer electronics, fleet, uh, insurance, manufacturing, public sector, retail, as well as security. And you can just see a, a, a number of just the statistics on the, the, the slide here. We have over 13 and a half million connected cars on our network. We have a lion's share of the automotive industry that AT&T connects. We have over 32 top automotive brands, um, everybody from Maserati to General Motors and Ford. Uh, there's a wide array of uh, different automotive manufacturers, and we support them in various ways for a lot of different services. Um, and we obviously can connect uh, a lot of our fleet um, and, and other uh, folks in a lot of different industries. AT&T is uh, the biggest uh, uh uh, provider in North America in the IoT space, um, and we continue to, to grow, uh, obviously, quarter over quarter. And some of the statistics that I'm sharing with you is as of the fourth quarter in 2020. So uh, really looking, looking forward to the discussion today. 
and hopefully uh, shedding some light uh, in particular around the automotive space. Great. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, next to just a self-introduction uh, would be uh, Christian uh, Massam from Center for Connected Business. Uh, Christian, a little introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation as well, Chris. Uh, my name is Christian Martin. I'm the Managing Director of the Center Connected Industry in Aachen, Germany. Um, here we have a huge innovation ecosystem on site of the RMWTH Aachen University, a site where we bring industrial users, solution providers, and technology providers together to create new innovative solutions, not only uh, in a kind of demo scale, uh, but real life and real size factories uh, where we produce, for example, um, electric vehicles here directly on site. You see the factory behind me, for example, where two uh, unicorns were born in that field. And where we try uh, really this ecosystem approach um, from the sensor system up to the computing edge system, the networks, uh, as well as the business application systems to have them ready when they leave the campus site here and we go to one of our big industrial users and partners uh, into the field test and later roll out, that it's just basically the last clicks we have to work on. And we're very pleased um, that by now we have over 400 industrial partners here. And uh, with one of them, um, my colleagues from Marvedia, uh, together um, we will answer your questions today in the regard of connected industry, not only in terms of technology, but also expertise you need to bring together uh, to create the solutions of the industry grace, as we can see also uh, with our partners nowadays already. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, next introduction would be uh, George Small, Move Incorporated. Well, thank you. Um, yep, my name is George Small. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Moog. I've um, been with the company about 25 years. Um, if we went on to the next slide, just to have a couple of slides. Um, let's see, I think there was a slide maybe missing here. Um, but I can talk about generally the company. Um, so we're about a $3 billion company, um, 13,000 people or, or so, about 50% of that in North America, 35% in Europe, um, the rest in Asia. And, and what we end up doing is um, precise motion control in um, areas where there's a higher consequence of failure sort of applications. And so we have an aircraft group uh, where we do flight controls for the Boeing 787 or an Airbus A350 or an Embraer E2. Um, we have military versions of that. Um, we have a space and defense business where we might do um, thrust vector controls for missiles, um, antenna pointing on a Mars lander. Um, and we have an industrial business where we might do the motion bases for flight simulation, um, injection molding and steel mill controls, um, and we have a medical business, um, and that's infusion pumps, um, feeding pumps, and the thing that ties all that together um, is this kind of um, background in motion control, uh, making things move. And so you can really you can think of us as a as a as a three billion dollar mechatronics company filled with a bunch of uh, folks that that really love what they do, love engaging with um, uh, customers and problems, and coming up with solutions. We don't tend to do high volume of anything. We do a good bit of manufacturing, but it's not in the higher volumes. We're not in automotive. Maybe you noticed uh, me saying uh, or not saying. Um, we tend to do engineering heavy sort of solutions, get closely tied with customers to understand what progress they're trying to make, and then come up with solutions for the applications in all those different areas. And it's always this background in how to make things move, um, the idea of how to do that safely. Um, uh, functional safety is a core discipline, and so... You can think of it as a company that's been in the making things move in the robotic space, um, in all these different domains, um, in harsh environments. Um, and then that's where we get to making sure that we're doing healthy innovation for those activities to get on the next programs or the next um, uh, customer problem that we've got um, with our existing customers, but also the idea of investing in growth beyond that core business, um, the idea of having to be bimodal, having to be looking farther out at what the future opportunities for our company might be, um, and so that's where we come to this idea that there's macro trends um, that we've identified over the like you know 10 plus years, focusing on innovation um, beyond our core businesses. That there's these trends around productivity, this pressing need to do more with less. Um, that we have the act, you know skilled labor to do um, work at scale is an ongoing problem for everybody, 
Um, and the same thing on the sustainability. I think everyone's well aware of the trends um, going on, the challenges that we face as a global community. We see those things as um, opportunities, um, given our background, to, to contribute, to do something. We see the enablers going on around us, um, the ubiquitous computing, um, sensing, um, the data um, analytics, the algorithms to add intelligence um, both in the cloud and um, locally at the edge um, where we identify very much with things that move out in and around the environment. And so the, the term we use is um, identifying opportunities. We think of it as automation outside the factory. And the slides we use internally to explain this um, to ourselves, we have pictures of an automotive assembly line in the 50s where you see cars going down the line and you see people working all over those cars um, to, to uh, move the production down the line. And you see a, a, a picture of that, uh, a modern picture, and what you'll see is robotic arms, very few people, and fences to be, basically keep the people away from the automation. Um, and there's been tremendous productivity gains. Um, and more recently, you might see that. Um, an example would be in warehouse logistics, where you see um, what Kiva's done for Amazon in automating fa um, their logistics operations, and you start seeing how the idea of what a warehouse might look like looks different. And it's this, this idea of leveraging automation to improve productivity that, of course, these things are electrically powered. Um, you know, it, it, um, that's, that's the, their, their natural state. There's a number of benefits that come from that. And so what we really want to do is see the open up the opportunities for this automation outside the factory and, and do it in a, um, um, to improve productivity and in a sustainable way. And so that's really what the little picture to the right just identifies our three company-level three themes that tie together all those different businesses that I mentioned um, that we see broad um, uh, applicability for electrification. We're exploring that in the air domain. Um, you can find work in the public domain that we've been doing to electrify construction equipment, um, um, the space domain in a large way has been electric um, for, for quite some period of time. We're trying to identify what the opportunities are in those spaces. Um, the autonomy and automation is another area back to, you know, since the inception of the company in the 1950s, we've been part of um, automation and robotics and, um, you know, making these things move. But we now see the enablers that I mentioned to the left um, opening up huge opportunities. And, and, of course, these things are connected in environment there isn't an you know, innovation activity that we've got, honestly, that isn't connected in some way, shape, or form in these harsh environments. And so we use this diagram as much internally as, as externally to talk about these, these three things reinforce um, each other um, and then kind of fuel the growth opportunities and this idea for um, um, growth beyond the core business. But it's really leveraging the kind of who we are, and that's where it's led us to some interesting use cases we see um, 5G um, connectivity as a central theme, and so we'll talk a little bit more about those as we get into the, the questions, but um, I'll, I'll stop there um, and make sure we uh, get uh, our panelists here to um, opportunity okay. to do introductions. Great. Uh, thanks, George. Um, uh, oh, next there we go. We it was just is, backwards. <laughs> is, uh, yeah. Next, we want to bring up um, our next uh, 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 panelist experts, and um, we're going to start with uh, self-introductions with uh, Adi Kushimo uh, from Ericsson. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Adi Kushimo, and I'm a sales director at Ericsson. Uh, within our customer, you global customer unit dedicated to at and I'm uh, currently responsible for Ericsson's enterprise uh, portfolio, which span IoT, 5G, as well as some of our <clears throat> SD-WAN services, and also responsible for our connected car program with at and and uh, today I'm here to talk about um, the role 5G plays in the digital transformation that we see within the automotive sector. Uh, 5G is here, as uh, Chris said, and uh, Ericsson is at the forefront of making this a reality across the globe. Uh, we're the first to deploy 5G across all four continents, the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Oceania. Uh, to date, we've deployed about 83 live networks across more than 40 operators across the globe. Next slide, please. And we at Ericsson, we see 5G really as a platform for innovation. And at the very core, um, you know, when you talk about the radio, the core, and all those um, communication services, the operation, the OSS and the BSS systems, we see all of this as enablers that then bring on uh, you know, a lot of features, like when we talk about network slicing and high speed and low latency. and uh, edge and every other buzzword that is associated with 5G. 
at the end of the day, we see all of this as enablers. And ultimately, uh, uh, the goal is to solve business challenges for our customers, uh, as which are service providers and their enterprise customers across a wide variety of use cases, which uh, I know today we'll talk a little bit more when we get into the Q&A. And you know, happy to answer any questions you have specifically as it pertains to the automotive industry. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, I want to, uh, for the next self-introduction, um, bring up uh, Ani uh, Basu of uh, Mavenir. Ani. Thanks, Chris. Uh, pleasure to be here, folks. I'm not going to run you through charts, which is a, which is a global first. Uh, I, I lead something called Emerging Business at a company called Mavenir, which incidentally, uh, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a context of the name. Mavenir stands for M plus Avenir. M is mobile and Avenir is French for the uh, for future. So mobile future. And that, that's very apt in today's context and increasingly more so as the world becomes more and more connected. Uh, we are about 15 years old. We are a bit of an upstart in the in the network infrastructure provider space. We are a cloud native, software first, open architecture, open principles, uh, on embracing disruptor in the, uh, in the communication stack. But before I jump into the company and our ambitions, I just want to maybe uh, define a little bit of a narrative on why we are here today and what we are discussing. So since the advent of, let's say, uh, telegraph machines in the first half of the 19th century to, to bots telephony in the second half of the 19th century, it took roughly about 100 years for people, uh, or for, for the first billion places to be connected. Then with the advent of the first mobile networks and first one G starting from even pre-2G eras to 2G, 3G, 4G, and what have you, over the last three to four decades, it actually took about one fourth of that time, i.e. 25 years, to connect the first billion people. We are now in a world, as we exited 2020, where there's more than 7.5 billion mobile subscriptions, more than five, to close to 6 billion people that are connected. Uh, we, we've seen uh, a dramatic evolution uh, and revolution, if you will, when it comes to uh, mobility and data transforming ordinary people's lives. And that's been essentially stuff that led up to 4G. Now, I read a very interesting statistic the other day. Uh, 2020 has been a pivotal year for many, well, for many, many different things. But uh, one of the positive things that I read about was IPC had predicted that the size of the digital universe in 2020 was 44 uh, zettabytes. That's 44 followed by 21 zeros. That's an enormous number. To just give you some context, if you add three more zeros to it, you get to a yottabyte. After that, you run out of the decimal system. Now, that means uh, all the bits and bytes of data, whether they're static, at rest, uh, that's essentially the entire digital universe that the world, uh, consumers, enterprises, industries are trying to feed off of. Now, in order for us to make sense of that data, uh, in order for 5G to be relevant, we need to make sure that the underlying network and the connectivity layer is programmable, accessible, uh, fluid, and tactile enough to allow enterprise and industry to really tap into the value pools that mobility and then this vast amount of data brings. Our role as Marvinier in this grand scheme of things is a very um, humble endeavor. We want to do what, what um, the App Store did for consumers with the, with the advent of the first smartphone in 2006. It abstracted the complexities of the network, created a huge amount of value over the top, it made mobility and data accessible to more than 7 billion people on the planet. Our ambition as Marvinir is to make the same networks equally relevant for industries, factories, manufacturing entities, warehouses, what have you, any kind of vertical, any kind of enterprise, to make these networks accessible and tactile enough that we are able to create uh, an app store for industries, if you will, to really be able to enable uh, all of you folks and the audience, the panelists here, to really extract the, the true values of mobility and data for enterprise digital transformation. Thank you very much. Glad to be here and looking forward to the discussions. Great, thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, and then uh, I want to move to uh, Dev uh, Kofla of uh, uh, Nokia to uh, give us your uh, introduction and anything else. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, you know, really appreciate the opportunity uh, thank you, 5G Americas. Thank you, George. 
Uh, it's really a privilege and honor uh, to be on this esteemed panel. Um, my name is Dave Kosla. Uh, I uh, lead uh, the enterprise uh, LTE and 5G business development group uh, at Nokia. So I uh, consider myself uh, very lucky to, um, to lead a group of uh, super talented subject matter experts uh, who work with uh, a number of customers and partners in different uh, uh, enterprise segments, such as manufacturing, uh, energy, uh, transportation, uh, logistics, uh, and education, uh, just to name a few. And, and the reason why this is very important is because, uh, you know, through these engagements and through these discussions, uh, my team and I are able to, uh, you know, find ways of accelerating the adoption of uh, 5G. So, um, you know, through my discussion, hopefully I can bring another angle uh, in addition to what has already been said, you know, from a 5G perspective. Uh, at the onset, uh, I, you know, I'd like to say a thing about, uh, you know, a word about uh, partners. Um, I really cannot overemphasize the importance of collaboration with our partners in the industry 4.0 uh, efforts. Um, you know, recently um, we strengthened our long relationship with at and uh, through a partnership uh, to help uh, businesses across the U.S. Uh, with their private network needs, um, you know, through uh, um, uh, enterprise-friendly 5G and LTE solutions called uh, Nokia Digital Automation Cloud. So uh, thank you so much for uh, the partnership, uh, uh, at and and also uh, looking forward to a fantastic panel. Um, next slide, please. So this is, uh, you know, again, uh, I'm not going to touch upon the 5G statistics. Again, uh, I think you guys are all very, very familiar that we are uh, one of the leaders of 5G. Uh, this slide actually provides an overview of uh, uh, private 5T, 5G and LTE networks as they are being adopted by multiple uh, segments uh, in the enterprise space. <clears throat> so one of the biggest challenges that I have with the chart is actually keeping up with the numbers. As many industry analysts have uh, recognized, we are the industry leaders here. Uh, every time that I put up this chart, you know, the numbers have actually moved uh, north, uh, which is a great reflection of how quickly the market is moving. Um, the reason why the private wireless networks become really important is because they provide uh, an avenue uh, by which enterprise uh, customers uh, can, in a very easy and uh, expedient fashion, uh, explore and develop the benefits of uh, 5G and LT networks. So <clears throat> we can discuss more about you know, what those kind of use cases are. Uh, but these provide, you know, highly reliable, uh, very secure, and uh, mission-critical uh, network solutions for enterprise needs. Uh, at the bottom of the chart, you'll see uh, the adoption across the multiple segments. Uh, initially, we had a lot of uh, success, you know, with the energy segment to begin with, and pretty much now, uh, practically every segment is adopting 5G and LTE solutions through these private networks. Uh, one of the latest ones that we have seen significant uptake is actually education. But as you can see in manufacturing, there is already 35 customers uh, who have embraced and deployed uh, private uh, LTE and 5G networks. Uh, next slide, please. So this, uh, this chart is just a bird's eye, uh, you know, eye view on uh, the kind of use cases that are possible. I think we all know there is a huge potential for 5G, so I'm not going to go into too many details about the use cases. Uh, the, the good news here is there is a lot of uh, breadth and depth in terms of the use cases that are relevant for 5G in the manufacturing space, uh, right from digitizing the, the factory campus or uh, connecting the workers or robots and machines. But one thing I, I, I do want to mention here is uh, relative to a shining example of, uh, you know, what's the art of the possible, uh, which is actually the Nokia 4G 5G factory in Finland. Uh, it was recognized uh, by the World Economic Forum as the industry leader back in 2019. Uh, overall, 30% productivity gain uh, has been achieved uh, in this factory, um, achieved uh, you know, significant uh, savings, millions of euros of annual savings, uh, and also a significant reduction, uh, as much as 80% reduction in terms of product lead times. So this is kind of the, the vision that we have, uh, you know, to be able to work with partners and customers uh, to uh, accelerate the adoption of 5G in the uh, manufacturing space and also in any other segments. So really looking forward to an interactive session here, and uh, back to you, Chris. Great. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, really appreciate it. Um, as they say in the auto industry, let's uh, you know, put our seatbelts on here and get to some uh, good uh, panel discussion and, and uh, questions. So one of my first is um, I do want to hit the road, I guess, as we would say, and ask um, a little bit more about you know, the, the, the automotive industry. And so I guess this would uh, uh, be a good question toward um, uh, Brian. Um, you know, what, what are some of the, 
biggest challenges um, or I guess opportunities where the enterprises uh, are trying to address in the automotive industry and um, you know how does you know wireless communication our technology and our evolution help that um, maybe you could address that a little bit Brian yeah, good question. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways in which the auto, auto industry as a whole is looking to uh, address various uh, concerns that, that, that are coming up. And obviously, each automotive manufacturer has its own strategy and some of the things that they're focused on. But I think collectively across the board, improving road safety has to be number one. I know according to like the World Health, the World Health Organization, about 1.3 million people die on the roads each year. So, and a lot of those, uh, unfortunately, happen to be a lot of the vulnerable road users, your pedestrians, your bike users, your motorcyclists, etc. So, using cellular technology, how can we start now? providing which we often refer to as bsm basic security messages over our network for some of the low latency uh, uh safety uh concerns that are addressing our roads each day and how can you now start to turn the uh turn all of these vehicles on this road to a completely interactive uh mesh network so to speak of different vehicles speaking to, to one another about their surroundings um, and areas up ahead that might be out of line of sight for the vehicle or even some of the sensor systems within the vehicle. I think another big uh, area that their manufacturers are looking to address is factory automation. I know several folks have kind of touched on it even in the introductions, but uh, as you all know, you know, a lot of these companies are laying hundreds of miles of uh, uh, wire and fiber and have uh, historically, but now what they're lo looking to do is as they re retool is how can 5G wireless technologies and edge computing help solve for a lot of the problems that they have um, to make them uh, obviously keep their factories running in a more effective and efficient manner than they have today. Uh, another big, uh, I think, area is over-the-air updates, uh, which seems quite silly when you start looking at smartphones and other everything else that we touch. But when you can start to do over-the-air updates for all the different electronic control modules uh, within the vehicle, really the, the possibilities are endless. And as these cars become even further and further uh, automated and, and start to get uh, the, the, a lot more compute power you know, throughout the vehicle, not just uh, within the infotainment or the head unit uh, space, um, a lot of these larger size firmware and software updates to the vehicle are going to be needed um, uh, of, honestly, for almost every vehicle probably being produced today and going forward. And then lastly, and I don't want to touch on you know autonomy slash automation uh, per se, because a lot of people skip right to stage five autonomy. Uh, but I think that they're, you know, the, the, the reality is, is as automation and the different steps of auto, you know, autonomy, the different levels of autonomy come to fruition, you know, cellular uh, technologies can play a huge role in providing non- line of sight uh, situational awareness data uh, to the vehicles, the driver, and, you know, whatever is going on with its surroundings. So I think those are probably the main focus areas right now within the industry. That's great. Yeah, it sounds like there's some good opportunity. Um, anyone else want to comment? Maybe, uh, Adi, I know that you're in this space a little bit. Um, anything that you would want to talk about as far as uh, the opportunities and, uh, you know, how even we're using maybe 5G and 4G today to, to address some of these issues? Oh, sure. Thank you, Chris. I think you know, Brian touched on, on a lot of the issues, but um, I think some of the ones that maybe I could add add to that as well is, uh, as you can imagine, I mean, a lot of uh, automotive OEMs and vehicles today are already outfitted with uh, embedded um, LTE connectivity. And, you know, as Brian mentioned, for software uh, updates, you know, being able to remotely control the car and, and get telematics data from the car, I mean, those are... Um, you know, some of the ways that are currently being used today. Uh, but then when you look forward in, into 5G, I kind of think about, well, what are the kind of things that they would, uh, they might want to do in the future, right? Uh, I think some of the things that come to, my, to mind as well is uh, the, making use of the low latency. And so, you know, think of a scenario where, um, you know, from a safety perspective, you need to get, information in real time or near real time and so the characteristics of 5g being able to put some of those applications at the edge of the network to reduce that low latency become very critical in addressing some of those challenges as well and uh, and i think maybe the other one that i'd like to touch on as well is uh, the fact of you know how do you uh, open up new revenue streams as well that's another uh, one of the uh, 
well, some, one of the areas too that comes up within the automotive industry as well. And what role does connectivity play in that? And so as you can imagine, I mean, once you have that connectivity and you're able to communicate with the car wherever it is, now you can imagine the kind of opportunities that opens up, you know, for example, whether it be more infotainment and uh, being able to download, you know, high quality graphics into the car for video, but then also in terms of think about how you display information within the vehicle, being able to leverage things like augmented reality as an example, as a way to have a much better visualization, visualization and immersion while you're driving the car. And that ultimately improves the driving experience as well for the consumers. So. Right. Thanks. So I want to move to a, a different, a little different scope. Um, one of the things, uh, uh, you know, George, in your presentation, you you look like your company, Moog Incorporated, was was addressing lots of different markets. Um, and you, I mean, so so w when you look at how you address the markets, and you m mentioned many in your that one slide, as um, are you looking at it as from a private wireless network versus a public network, or a hybrid, or or, or what do you what do you look at as as far as when you're looking at solutions? Is it is it is it, is it a question of that easy where uh, I use a private wireless network here, or I use a public network here, or I use a combination, or, or how does that fit in with your? Yeah, question? well, that's a good, uh, that's a really good question. I think you know, honestly, where we are, we're in explore mode, and we've been working with our partner Nokia and Dev's team to like explore this space. Um, we've been working on automation, as I mentioned, outside the factory. You can a lot of ways think about the discussion we just had around automotive and think, well, what about everywhere else, right? And so, you know, where else can this benefit? And and the idea that it's going to be not just um, machines, but it'll be machines and people working together collaboratively. And so that's what gets us into, we, we have our kind of background from a functional safety point of view, separating things into, you know, less critical and more critical applications, or even, you know, within applications, partitioning um, solutions into those sort of categories or looking at it as sort of a continuum. And so what actually will be doable with private, uh, with public network versus private will probably be somehow sorted by criticalities and the con consequence of failure. And so if you think of what could happen, what are the, we have the, the word safety have been used a bunch of times. Um, the, the, op the um, you know, doing the assessment of what the hazard is gets you into what levels of integrity these systems need to have in order to support the applications. And so that's where um, it feels to us at this point to be exploring both what we can do in the public um, network space and what we can do, what we're going to have to move to private to have higher levels of control, security, um, determinism. Um, those are the kind of words that we usually throw around as we think of higher criticality, higher consequence of failure, the less susceptible to um, outside influence. And so all those sort of things that we think of in these um, higher criticality environments, um, we need to, we can feel in our applications, be able to cover the spectrum, and so that's really why the experimentation takes place to find out what is feasible, what is um, what's going to be deployable, what does it take to actually field these applications. That's the learning curve we're on now. We're actually driving hard to summer deployments, and it's not quite as easy as we thought. And, and so it's um, you know there's there's work to do in terms of ease of use, and so it's all opportunity space. But it's really exciting, and so I I hope to have even better answers to your questions. Uh -huh at the end of the summer, um, but it feels important to us to explore uh, this space. So, uh, so George, look, this is Brian. Uh, let me yeah. ask you a question. So I know uh, from an AT&T standpoint, I mean, I think you touched on this. The, the main probably drivers from a lot of our customers is, as you had pointed out, SLAs, uh, service uh, level availabilities, as well as security. Are you seeing that, too, as kind of the, the two top two asks uh, of a lot of the customers, especially as it relates to private networks? I, honestly, I, I feel like they're kind of leaving it to us, but as we think about more critical applications, those are going to become really big deals. We have to move past this super low latency or, you know, honestly, there's a little bit too much um, hype, hype or buzzwords to it to, like, if we're going to actually apply yeah. um, really low latencies, we, we need hard determinisms if we're going to apply those into critical applications. It's not enough to say it's usually like this or, you know, we're used to coming from an environment of, no, it, 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 it shall be no worse than this. You know, it's 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 a requirement, and so how to how to figure out where that is? We feel like we're in the end, like in a position being asked to figure out what those requirements are for the applications. We're mainly dealing with the folks that have the application and the problem, and so right. so I think it's um, definitely there's opportunity space there, and I think 5G's got an important role to play. But I think we'll end up having to look at like the the environments differently depending on what we're trying to do with it. All right. 
Well, let me let me ask. I mean, let's let's build on that, and then I'm going to pose this question to to, to Dev, and then also to uh, Christian. Then where do we see um, how can 5G? I mean, it looks like George is saying, hey, we're looking for solutions, um, maybe uh, on a lots of different areas, and latency obviously might have been overhyped a little bit. It sounds like you, you mentioned, but maybe for for Dev and and also for Christian, where does um, where do you see 5G transforming the manufacturing industry? And is that 5G, uh, is, you know, again uh, on a macro level, level or, um, or or specific for a factory, or how, how do you see it transforming the, the, the manufacturing industry? I'll start with Dev, and then maybe move to Christian after that. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. And um, and you know, uh, just to add one point to uh, to what George said, right? In terms of the private networks, I think. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the private networks, they themselves, you know, uh, the private LTE 5G network that I def uh, described earlier, is, uh, is mainly a stepping stone uh, to, uh, to be able to drive, you know, a broader set of, uh, you know, solutions. It could be a hybrid uh, public and private network. Uh, th th really, the point there is to be able to bring in a catered solution that will provide uh, an enterprise the opportunity to be able to try out new things uh, in a very confined uh, kind of environment, so that's what the you know the end act based uh, private solution enables. Um, coming to the question about uh, the uh, the potential of 5G in the manufacturing space is obviously huge. If you look at you know the scale, right? I mean, there's approximately uh, 10 million factories across uh, across the world, and also as I mentioned earlier, the uh, you know the the suite of use cases that are possible. Uh, you could digitize your factory campus. You could uh, automate your shop floor. Uh, you can uh, connect your workers and you can uh, leverage a lot of efficiency through autonomous uh, mobile robots uh, and connect your devices. So the, the potential is clearly very, very broad and very huge. Uh, so, you know, clearly uh, from an art of the possible perspective, as I mentioned earlier, so maybe just uh, kind of taking a deeper dive into that example of Nokia's uh, 4G, 5G factory, uh, one of the biggest challenges that the factory had was really keeping up with the demand for the 4G, 5G equipment and the type of uh, different modules that they, need, that they needed to manufacture. And the more conventional setup for a factory is that, you know, there are a lot of cables uh, connecting all these different machines, which doesn't allow a lot of flexibility in terms of the factory layout. So one of the first things that they did was, you know, connect the, the entire factory, the entire shop floor, you know, with a private, private 4.9G network. Uh, which uh, allows them a lot of flexibility. Uh, 80 to 90 percent of the product lead times were reduced just uh, by virtue of doing that. On top of it was a layered approach, you know, to be able to connect the different assets. Uh, so now you have, uh, you know, asset tracking through wireless mechanism coming through. Uh, and once you combine all of those things together, uh, you know, the uh, clearly the benefits in terms of productivity, improving lead times, etc., can be fairly substantial. Uh, but one thing I also do want to mention is sometimes you know, there are quick wins, uh, which may not be necessarily in the space of uh, artificial intelligence and analytics, which would obviously come in you know, at the uh, later stages. Um, and one of the examples I, I want to bring out here is you know, for a, a paper processing plant here in the U.S., uh, you know, the, the kind of environment uh, with a lot of steel and, uh, you know, that, that the factory has in very tall buildings, uh, they were struggling to have even reliable connectivity for their workers inside uh, the factory environment. So, uh, you know, a lot of uh, challenges that Wi-Fi was posing in terms of how the technology could be, could be used. Uh, and, you know, just by bringing in one LTE base station uh, inside, the, uh, inside the, 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 the building, we were able to connect uh, very seamlessly all of these. So it was like magically, you know, something that was so complex that it, it was going to take uh, more than 150 access points for them to be able to cover, uh, you know, that uh, factory. Uh, and even then, there they wasn't reliable connectivity. Uh, just by virtue of bringing LTE uh, into that factory, you know, that problem was solved so immediately. So uh, look out for all those quick wins. And, and the other thing I also wanted to mention is that today, Private LTE already addresses, you know, like 85% of 5G use cases. So there is, uh, once you've identified the goals, uh, you know, there is a start that you can already make as of today. So, great. Thanks. Well, let me. Um, I want to move on though to Ani. Just get your thoughts about you. You talked about in your application uh, and how you're. I mean, how Mavenir can you know look to transform things. Um, is it the possibility of transforming as well in the area of 
uh, manufacturing and making it more simple in that area, or uh, can you explain anything? Yeah, sure. I, I, let me not do a, a, a company plug here. So yeah. I'll try to put private networks and in, in the industrial ecosystem in a, in a bit of context. Private networks, I'll, I'll start with private networks first. They're not necessarily a new thing. Private networks have been around. You've had LMR, PMR systems for, for a while. Uh, private LTE started to come into these national security, public safety kind of applications, blue light services. AT&T has been running FirstNet for quite a while. But traditionally, they've been kind of either enterprise live or, or focus on a, a specific voice or data related services as part of an adjunct to a public cellular network. What's kind of different now is that we are looking at an application of the connectivity and the data enablement layer for non-consumer applications. Specifically, we are, we are looking at how can these kind of connectivity constructs or these kind of networks or these kind of systems be relevant to activate and, 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 and realize uh, the digital transformation of cyber physical systems, mission critical systems, production critical systems, things that are built around industrial IoT and so on. Specifically speaking, if you look at the manufacturing sector or regardless, I mean, any kind of vertical, there's, there's, there are some key drivers on why you need these kind of dedicated networks. Whether they're operated by CSPs or, or by the enterprises themselves is more of an operating model. But the key drivers in my mind are four. There's a requirement for guaranteed coverage. So either in remote or underserved areas or indoor or in, uh, in building where macrocellular coverages don't reach. There's a requirement for very specific network control to apply configurations that are not uh, supported in a public network. There are very specific performance requirements and profiles that, that will really support very demanding applications and quality of service guarantees that you don't necessarily need or, or even see in microcellular consumer-oriented networks. Last but not, this, uh, not the least, and this is not a topic that we've spoken of uh, in the last 45 minutes so much, uh, security is one of the key drivers on why we need some of these uh, these networks as well. Whether it's uh, the constructs of identity and access management, uh, privacy and data integrity, and so on. Now, if, when it comes to let's say the, the the palette of technologies on hand, we tend to start thinking that yeah, LT is there, five G is great, and so on and so forth. I I'm going to blaspheme a bit. This is probably a very cellular and three GPP. Uh, uh, love fest, but I want to kind of point out that there, there's horses for courses when it comes to the radio access side. There's definitely, as Dave, I think, already pointed out, there's a long tail for LTE and 4G. Simply because it's a global ecosystem, there's established scale, there's modules, there's device availability, there's an upgrade path to 5G, etc. But there's equally, I would say, depending on constrained environments, uh, cost issues, Certain low power wide area technologies or even things like Wi Fi evolution or NFC or, or, or Bluetooth LE, there will be a space for those kind of access uh, mechanisms to also have a play in the so called 5G network, if you will. What's kind of critical is all of these multi access capabilities need to kind of dovetail into a very uh, cloud oriented. A central core switching network, if you will, that, that is able to hand these, uh, handle uh, the, these multitude of different access uh, environments. But given that, I did want to, however, shout out or give a shout out to why 5G. Everyone gets caught up in the hype of you know sub one millisecond latencies, enormous gigabit throughputs, and so on. But it's important for us to reflect that 5G is, for the first time, a G that has been designed grounds up to cater for very specific operational technology parameters. So things like flexible numerology or URLLC or spatial diversity or positioning aspects to, uh, to, to spectrum flexibility, all of these constructs that you hear about in 5G have predominantly happened because over the last 10 to 12 years, across both standards bodies or bodies uh, such as 5G Americas or 5G ACIA, uh, industries and enterprises have fed in requirements that are now being baked into, uh, in, 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 into different releases, like release 16 and so on. So 5G, truly speaking, is one of, uh, it's an inflection point for our industry in the sense that we are, for the first time, able to address a very niche and very 
focused industrial applications and operational technologies. One of the basic plumbing things I think the gentleman from Mogul already mentioned, uh, a lot of communications on manufacturing floors in, 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 in factory floors are based on field buses that, that focus on quasi-proprietary industrial Ethernet wide connections. And all of this diversity of protocols, the restrictions of wide connections, are, are creating a lot of complex operating environments. So 5G, not just because it's, it's, it's got capacities and throughputs that rival fiber, it's, it's got uh, extremely low latencies, but 5G is also an opportunity to consolidate industrial networking complex, things like time-sensitive networking, which is now being specified in 3GPP. So what I'm basically kind of say, saying is that there, there is a tool set, absolutely. All of those tool sets will be used in the manufacturing industry, but there's definitely a real reason why 5G is so relevant. And one last point I kind of wanted to make is that we also always get caught in the plumbing and, and the fancy bells and whistles of, of, of the G. But I just wanted to maybe conclude my, my statement by saying that it's another inflection point in the industry in the sense this is the first time that IT building practices and telecoms building practices are, are truly employed to create the next generation of networks. That means when you go to an enterprise or an industry, you can't bring a bag and baggage of TGPP cellular technologies and go to an enterprise person and say, have at it. You need something that is as simple as, as being able to deploy, you know, your, your, your office workflow environment, your, your CRM systems. It needs to be much more IT-like. So 5G in, in terms of a network building construct, why it will be relevant for not just manufacturing or automotive, not just because of capabilities, but also because of the way we can build it. It's much more IT-like. It's much more... Uh, democratized, I'd say. Yep. yep. That was a yep. long explanation, <laughs> but now Christian's back. Yeah, Christian's back. So, so yeah, well, you know, I'm going to throw it wide open, Christian, because I know uh, there's been a lot of discussion um, today, and I want to, uh, you know, from Center for Connected Business and your experience, you know, where are we with what, what you're doing and where are we going to go when it comes to things like industrial IoT and the manufacturing side? So I'm going to kind of just throw it open to you. Um, what we see um, is basically at the cusp uh, of all the changes we're talking about, of digitization in industry, and it all starts the same way with connecting all the devices we already have. And that's one of the biggest problems we're actually facing. Uh, since everything you find on the shop floor um, is older um, than what we know with our technologies now. It doesn't have LTE, it doesn't have 5G. You need to get it connected first hand to run all the exciting new things. You can base on condition monitoring for all the efforts uh, on automated control and so on. That's the first task to fulfill. And the first challenge, actually, when we talk um, with our industrial partners from all over the domain, uh, might be with the head of production, the head of IT. What are they telling you? Uh, please connect everything. Bring in sensor systems, autonomous guided vehicles, whatever it is, but please don't connect it to Wi-Fi anymore. Uh, because we are basically at a limit with that. They won't let you, so you actually have to start with mobile networks with a private LTE, for example, or with a 5G. Um, might depend on the use case if you need 5G already from the start. Um, as we heard, and I would agree with that, there were quite some cases where LTE is quite capable and will be capable enough to handle it. Uh, but the other thing is um, also reliability and flexibility in how you will scale or how it will change as a business, the use cases you want to connect to it, and where comes in the 5G uh, ecosystem aspect. Since it's built for industry and different use cases, it might be over-engineered at the start, but it grows with you. That's what we see with um, the use cases of the partners we work with, um, that it can basically handle that. You have a reliable network which does all the things and makes it easier since you're already running one of the most heterogeneous landscapes in terms of information systems and everything. You don't want to have a network for positioning. You don't want to have a network for the machine communication. You don't want to have a network for your AGVs and so on, because that's what we're all facing right now. And as a first, uh, as a first, uh, that industry starts to understand not only the big 30 in each country, but also the others, also the SMEs, that there might be a chance um, that you have one ecosystem. You can run this and you can grow. You can add, um, as we heard before, within an app store, your services, your applications, your use cases, kind of off the shelf, maybe as easy as, as a push of a button. 
that might be still a vision, but that's where that's where we want to head to. That's what we want to reach. So for us um, and the partners we talked of, 5G is a big promise and a potential. It might be starting with LTE, but from our point of view, if you want to be a data-driven company, a next level and connected company, you will end up with 5G or very something very similar to it, and maybe just in some retrofit uh, scenarios, as we are running also right now, you just use machine connectivity maybe on another level, but your backbone is uh, quite often uh, from now on in the future a mobile network. Great. All right. I can't believe it, but time is just flying. So um, I want to ask uh, 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 Brian, uh, George, and Christian a question, and it's a little bit about the future, um, easing into the future here. Uh, so it's the crystal ball question, and it's you, you can pick. It can be five years or 10 years. I, I mean, thank goodness the pandemic's over in, in 2026 or 2031, okay? So uh, hopefully we can all be in the same room or someday and uh, see each other. But um, the question I have, and I'll start with Brian, okay? What, what, what do you see in your crystal ball uh, in the next five or 10 years or, and how companies in the automotive industry will be utilizing 5G or, or 4G at that time if you want? And uh, you know, where do you see it going? You know, uh, and then I'm going to ask a, a similar crystal ball question to uh, to the next two panelists. So Brian, okay, I'll try to be brief. Yeah, I'll try to be brief. So in the next five years, as you know, the automotive industry uh, it takes a little, it takes some cycles to actually roll these out, get the hardware, obviously uh, automotive grade hardware, and get these into vehicles uh, and produce. So I see around more of the 2023, 2024 timeframe for 5G to really hit the automotive industry. We're already working with a number of manufacturers who want to be first to market. Um, but uh, like anything, especially in the automotive industry, there's, there, those are sub substantial um, bill of material costs associated with going to 5G. So I think I, it'll be a progression to, uh, to which the, the rest of the industry will follow suit. So really within the next five years, it'll be a slow trickle of additional manufacturers that will come on. Obviously, generally starting with your luxury brands uh, and trickling down to, to more the entry level. Um, and in that space, I see uh, continue, continued um, effort and energy um, an interest around info, uh, in car entertainment. A lot of these over the top services, games, video games, downloads, um, streaming services. That's going to be huge. High definition, high definition mapping is going to be uh, also something that uh, is, is, is going to come up pretty strong within the industry. Real time diagnostics and firmware updates, uh, as I kind of mentioned earlier. And then as, uh, and then really kind of that, uh, as we move to 5G, are really moving from kind of the roadside infrastructure um, and, and starting to get these the more intelligent transportation uh, communications between these vehicles and the its surrounding environment. Great. So try to be uh, brief. No, that's good because uh, we're almost in like the lightning round. We, we uh, time has <laughs> flown by. So exactly. So, so let me go to um, uh, George and uh, uh, same type of question. You can pick five years yep. or ten yep. years. But what do you see is um, you know, what, what new applications and services or what's in your crystal ball that will be unleashed to uh, help your customers? I, I, uh, I think so plus one to what Brian said, that, that that's opening up all this opportunity space. Um, there's people, we've, we've been spending a lot of time in the construction space as an opportunity to improve productivity. What we're seeing is people with a vision of what this connected work site might look like and how you could do things differently. What I feel like we're just on the edge of is like I'm, I'm, I'm old enough, I had a computer in my house that was not connected, and then the Internet came to my computer. That's about to happen here in these environments where you cannot get connectivity. Just think of the changes that are going to happen. We're already starting to see this when we show up with these, you know, deployed basically robots um, in the field, and we have the connectivity to talk to those robots, but people are saying, hey, can I connect to that too? If you brought that out here, I, I want to do this. And I think we're just on the edge of, like this unleashing of massive connected, um, you know, and, and all the disruption you've seen that that's created in people's houses and in factories you're about to see in the outdoor environments. Great. Thanks. All right. So now we have time for a brief answer. Uh, again, same question for, uh, for Christian. Uh, what are your thoughts if you look out five years, 10 years of what you're working on and, and what might be the most impactful real quick? Uh, to be honest, I don't know what will be in 10 years, but what we can see already since we're working on it in two to three years top, um, is basically that it will enable kind of real life supply chains, real life production cycles, uh, which are highly automated in terms of processes without any hindrances and bringing basically high performance edge computing on the shop floor so that you can use, for example, um, 
data you generated just from cameras or something like that running with your forklift with your HV for the factory, just doing your material flow stuff, bringing from point A to point C, uh, you can identify the assets you see in the way. You can categorize them, you can see um, how do they, what do they belong to, to which order, so you never lose anything in the factory anymore because you have an inventory system basically on the fly. So basically, um, added value with all what you're using, with all what you're connecting, it multiplies. It's never only for one use case. You will be able to share it, use it for other applications. And by now, uh, and in two years, we, two, three years, we won't be restricted uh, to the shop floor on one factory side. Uh, it will be working from one private network to the public network to the next private network and so on, fluently with the services you use for your application as stakeholder and the function you are as um, if it was always with you. So continuous and transparent, flexible supply chain. Right. Wow. The future sounds good uh, for 5G as well as uh, LTE, as somebody mentioned uh, earlier uh, on the panel. So uh, again, I would just, uh, on behalf of 5G Americas, I, I want to thank uh, Brian, Christian, George, uh, Adi, Ani, and Dev for uh, some of your insights today about where we're going uh, on the road and, and automotive as well as in the factory. I know we seems like time uh, went uh, by extremely fast, but I guess that's the 5G world of low latency. It, we go fast, right? And so I wanted to thank you all, all your companies, uh, yourselves for spending the time today because I know uh, some, some places, uh, Christian, it's quite late where you are. Uh, but thank you so much on behalf of 5G Americas and our Board of Governors. Um, look for 5G Americas white papers uh, on these important subject matters uh, on our website, which is www.5gamericas.org. Also, there will be a replay of this um, event, uh, so you can find that, and there will be links uh, from our website uh, if you want to look at a replay. But again, uh, on behalf of 5G Americas, our Board of Governors companies, and a big thank you to everyone out there. Stay safe. Uh, stay healthy, and a big thanks to those panelists. Thank you so much, and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.